I am here today to talk to you a little bit about um, my science, my love for it, and how I got there. And a lot of times I get questions from girls like yourself saying, how do you get to do your job? It sounds like so weird, it actually is. Um, and so I will tell you a little bit about my story, uh, which is kind of a complicated story, but let's start. And I called it, you know, the story of my path. And I have here a little path with a bifurcation because in truth, all our lives, no matter what we do, are really about choices. The choices we took and the ones we didn't take. And you really wonder all the time, what if I had done the other thing the other year when I did instead this thing? Um, so I'll jump straight into it. And um, I will start my story up more or less at the age when, um, when I was about year 10 or so. And I was in school in Italy and I was very unhappy. I had lots of friends, but um, didn't really get on very well with them. I felt a bit like, like a misfit. And, um, and so my parents, of course, were very worried about me because I wasn't fitting in very well. And, um, tried to find opportunities that perhaps were not a traditional opportunity uh, in a normal school. And my mother um, heard about this uh, school system called the United World Colleges, uh, that is um, an international school system. Uh, you get in on a scholarship and they're all over the world. And today there's a lot more, but in, back in, in, in 1988, when I went there, there were about six. And um, I ended up in the one in Italy, which was the closest one to my family. My father wouldn't let me go. And, um, and uh, there started a very, very big adventure that marks me to this day. Um, I lived in this beautiful spot. <laughs> it looks like a movie. In fact, I lived in the building on, on the right-hand side of the screen, which was the dependence of the castle of this uh, village. And in there, I lived with uh, uh, children my age from 60 different countries. And there really started my, uh, my revival. I started having friends, which was a big change for me, because everybody seemed to be like me. And here, I like a, a little message for you. I have here, um, it's coming on your screen now, three photographs. And um, the photographs, the, the top one is myself and my three roommates back uh, when I was at the college. The one in the middle sitting right next to me, so I don't know if you see the mouse, I'm there in the, in the white and maroon jumper, and next to me is Karen. Now Karen became a superstar in China. She's probably the, the Britney Spears of China today. And on the left there, you see her in a, a poster of a world tour that happened a few months back. And in the bottom picture, there's myself, my children, my husband at the back. And on the right, there is Karen herself. And on the left, there's her mom. Now, why am I showing you this? It's because I think one very important message I'd like to, to send to you is this age, your age, is the age when you make friends for life. You know, look around yourself, these girls around you. Uh, some you will lose touch with, some you will lose touch and you will regain touch 20 years from now. But they are really the friends that go in your guts. And it's really the only age when you make this incredibly, incredibly tight connections. Don't let go of them, they really matter. And in fact, you know, with Karen, I saw her a few months back as she was on World Tour and it was fantastic. And many of my friends from those years um, stayed that close and really helped me through all the hard times and the good times of my life. Now, back at the school, um, I was in um, basically coming into the school, which was the last two years of high school, so the year 11 and 12. And I had to choose uh, my, effectively, my HSC subjects. And there again, choice, choice, choice. What am I going to do? Now, I always loved physics since I was a little girl. So physics was obviously top of my list. And maths, of course, goes uh, hand in hand with that. Now, my mother wouldn't let me go out of the house unless I chose philosophy in HSC because she says, it'll serve you well. And he actually did. And so I did physics, philosophy, and maths, which were my, uh, let's call it, higher level subjects. I had uh, four uh, or five contact hours a week. And then I had to choose my mother tongue, Italian, my sec a second language, which was English, and a third subject, whatever I wanted. And I chose another subject in science because I love science, so I did biology. Now, it's very hard to choose when you're your age. It's, it's, it's just, of course, many of you probably like more than three or four subjects that you'll have to do at HSCs. So uh, it's very difficult, and uh, maybe it is very unfair to ask people your age to, to choose so early. But, you know, this is, the, this is what we have to do. So think really hard about um, what you love more than what will give you a job. And I'll come back to that theme very soon. So how do you make that choice? How do you, do you select out um, a handful of subjects? So first of all, of course, um, you know, 
I really love physics, so that was an obvious for me. But you might not know exactly what. So ask around, talk to your friends, talk to your uh, mentors, talk to your career advisor, your teachers, your parents, your parents' friends. But before that, ask yourself, what do you really, really like? What is that thing that when you're just sitting down with it, time just goes and you don't even notice? Do not choose because of job availability. Often people say, oh, you'll do astronomy, forget getting a job ever. Um, choose, but also remember that people have perceptions and not all of them are necessarily right. And the world is a big place. And maybe in uh, Western New South Wales, there's a dearth of jobs in a certain sector, but in Eastern New South Wales, it's actually not so bad. So do not necessarily trust somebody's opinions about jobs. Um, do not even choose because of your own perceived availability of jobs. Um, if you start doing a subject because you think, oh, I'll get a job when I come out of school or come out of university, uh, first of all, it might not be so later on, but also you will be choosing not according to what you like. Um, now, a big question I, a lot of kids ask me is, well, you know, I like a lot of things, but I don't know exactly what I like the most. And that is a fair question, and, and many people are like that. So that becomes a little harder. So in a sense, you have to start asking yourself a bit harder, listening to yourself a bit more. Really see what it is that uh, you do and you don't notice time passing. Um, it is a hard one, though, to answer. Um, what if you have a passion, but you're not sure you're good enough? Now, this is another interesting one, because I would say, um, don't worry about that. Follow your passion anyway. A little girl uh, in, a, in a girl's school in Sydney the other day asked me, um, well, look, I really like singing, but I'm pretty sure I'm not good at it. So that's an interesting one, because singing is such a vocational thing. You really do need a talent there. So in a sense, depending on what it is that your passion's in, you do have to listen a little bit about whether you have a talent in it. But mostly, if you like it, you'll be good at it. You'll be certainly good enough at it. Now, okay, going back to me, after all these choices in high school, I did my two years. I got my international baccalaureate, which is a effectively, it's an international HSC system. And then I had to choose again. What am I going to do at university? Well, the subject wasn't really the problem for me. I really wanted to do physics. Uh, however, where was the problem? Because having been in an international school, I now knew that the world really was open to me, and it wasn't just Bologna, which was my hometown, or even the town where I did school, which was in northeastern Italy. So, but a good person, uh, a director of studies, like a career advisor, said to me, well, if you don't know, start with what you know. Start with home, go back. I went back to Bologna. Bologna is one of the top universities in Italy, so I had no problem here. In the pictures, we have the, uh, the Department of Astronomy, which is in the tower, you see. Um, the tower uh, where Galileo himself had actually gone for a, a job interview and been rejected. And in fact, went to Padua University. So um, it was quite a nice, prestigious institution, and I went back. However, a month into my classes, I encountered the same problems I had when I was in high school in Italy. And that was kind of very rigid prescribing teachers, uh, telling me what to do and what not to do, and looking at me on the outside and not trying to really understand me on the inside. And I hated it. And so I went straight back into the crisis I had in year 10. And I just had to get out of there again for the second time. And I ended up uh, looking around and realizing that England was really a good option for me. It was relatively close to Italy and it had great universities. And so I applied to various places and I got in at University College London, which is obviously in London. And the picture in the middle is, is the front of the university. And that was an amazing place. I was walking straight into big professors' offices and they would say, OK, oh, who are you? Uh, tell me about yourself. What do you like? You know, can you imagine? You know, somebody actually paid attention. At uh, UCL, I met my husband on the, well, at the time my boyfriend. In fact, it was my instructor. I shouldn't really say that. I got really <laughs> fantastic grades um, on the bottom left. And uh, eventually we did get married when I was doing my PhD and he's now my husband. Um, of course, uh, again, there were lots of choices, um, but my path became much straighter. I really wanted to do physics. One, um, uh, actually, I decided astrophysics sounded like an interesting flavor of physics, so off I went and did that. Um, a little interlude about what do you do in terms of jobs in astrophysics. Well, of course, you can become an astrophysicist, which is what I am, so that's the obvious thing, but that is not a job for everybody, and also there's not many jobs in that area. However, these four uh, 
little pictures from LinkedIn are from my uh, four of my friends that did that PhD in astrophysics with myself. None of them became an astrophysicist. They all became uh, business people, effectively, usually in technical businesses. Um, and the one thing that strikes me about this, these friends, whom I am still in touch with today, is that they didn't just become uh, pawns in industries starting from graduate level entry. They rose to the top very, very fast. They founded their own companies. And that is because astrophysics, like physics, and like many other technical degrees like that, uh, gives you really the ability of thinking and lateral, lateral thinking. So they entered with many other graduates, say, in, in more technical subjects such as IT and engineering, but they rose to the top very fast and became the team leaders in those specific companies. After I finished my PhD, so did my degree, then I went straight into PhD, uh, I didn't go into industry. I decided I really do want to be an astronomer. And I went to be a postdoctoral research assistant. These are relatively short positions. My first one was in Switzerland, in Zurich. The top left, we have actually my department, one of the, the top right house in there was my, my, my department. Uh, the bottom right, you see Zurich in all its beautiful glory near the Alps. And on the bottom left, we have Einstein in his 40s when he was in Zurich at the patent office um, thinking about special and general relativity, which eventually became why he got the Nobel Prize. Um, after that, as I said, it's a temporary position. And so I returned to London uh, and I got a really nice fellowship back at my university. But I kind of graduated from uh, University College London. I also graduated from London. I was really through with the weather and the weather and the weather. I hated the weather. And so after a few months, I decided I just can't do this. Um, and I decided to move again. And there was an opportunity uh, in New York City this time. So you can see the pattern, right? It's a lot of international uh, travel, not so much because I'm, you know, I have a hot feet and I have to run all the time, but because astronomy is a global field and you really work internationally. In New York, I started working at the American Museum of Natural History. In the picture, you see the planetarium, uh, part of the museum. And my office was a row, uh, the row window on the left of the big ball. Uh, one of those was my office. So I was looking onto the planetarium the whole time. In there, I did research, just like I'd done in Switzerland. But in addition, I encountered a lot of interesting people. I gave uh, tours to Bruce Princeton and uh, the mayor of New York and the mayor of London and the uh, presidents of like the vice president of the United States. So it was actually quite exciting. But fundamentally, my research went on. I did a lot of uh, radio work, a lot of uh, exhibitions. Here at the bottom, I, um, I was at the opening of the Einstein exhibit on the centenary of uh, uh, special relativity. So I had a fantastic time, both socially, I learned to write scripts for documentaries. I, I, it was really great. And my work became so deep because it wasn't just the research anymore, but it was also uh, so much more social and so many, um, I guess, more artistic as well. So, but what do astrophysicists do? What was my work? What is my research? Well, we uh, sit in offices just about like everybody else in the world, in the universe. This is Sebastian in my office in, back in New York, and he was looking for stars that move very fast, and these are stars that are very close, and he was compiling a census of the local galaxy. And he was, every time he found a new one, he would put it on his glass there. We go to observatories. Many of us uh, travel to observatories. They tend to be not in New York City, not in busy cities, which have a lot of lights, but in high, dark places. This is at the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, the CFHT, Canada's France Hawaii Telescope. And I had a really great time. I went observing there many times. You travel, you fly there, you observe two, two three, four, five nights, and then you go home and look at the data you got at the observations. Uh, see, this is me, um, other observatories. On the left, at Kitt Peak. On the right, a CTAO in the Andes, in the Chilean Andes. Actually, the, the right picture was taken um, about two months after my first child was born. I had an observing run, I had to go, and my husband was home with the baby. Uh, in here, we have myself again at the observatory. You would imagine observatories are telescopes, and uh, uh, astronomers look through telescopes, but that's not the way it is done today anymore. We go in front of a computer again. So here in the back, you have uh, Doug. He was a telescope operator. He just moves the telescope, and I looked at the observations uh, through monitors, screens, computers. Um, and you do that during the night, of course. So we live by night and we sleep by day. It's very interesting. After a few days, you get into the vibe of the night. It's fantastic. Um, we don't just do that. Of course, we 
sit in front of a computer and we go to conferences about two, three times a year. I travel all over the world. I've just been to Beijing uh, last week. And we meet with, uh, with, with people who are passionate about the science, and usually science is similar to science you do. I do stars, these people do stars. What is wonderful, and again, the theme of friendship uh, comes up again here, um, is that over the years, these friendships become real friendships. They're colleagues, but they're real friends. They're almost like a family of sorts. Um, in Beijing last week, I met people that, in fact, it was the 20th anniversary of my meeting some of them when we were all students. Uh, and it is a fantastic feeling, this continuity. And not all jobs give you that. Many jobs, you, you move quite a bit. But in academia, you tend to be very, um, you stay with the same group of people. And of course, some new people, some new students, some people uh, who have moved on and retired. But this is just part of the continuity of life. And talking of the continuity of life, one of my most dear pictures in my whole career, and I call it the picture of my babies, because here on this couch uh, about seven years ago, there's two of uh, my natural babies, my biological babies, the little ones here in the front is Chiara and the back is Elliot, who were little at the time, they're all teenagers today. And the other three, there's myself at the back, and the other three are my first three PhD students. So PhD students are graduate students, so they've done their degree and they're now doing their research degrees. And they were my, uh, my students because I mentored them into their research projects and throughout the time that uh, led them to get in their thesis. And um, that was a, it's an amazing privilege to be do, doing that. And I feel very maternal with them. Um, and uh, the, the, all three of them have today graduated and moved on to jobs. Uh, one of them is still in astronomy and the other two went into industry. But it is a fantastic privilege and a very, very nice part of my job to be able to uh, mentor younger people. Now, what about my son? I work on all stars. And here, many of you are too young probably to even recognize these people, but these are some of the biggest uh, actors uh, that were, uh, several have died. In fact, all of them have died. Oh, my goodness. Um, it's not these old stars that I work on, but rather this old star. So this is a Hubble Space Telescope picture of Sirius. Sirius is the brightest star in the sky, both northern and southern hemisphere. Um, and uh, it wasn't until even 100 years ago, people realized Sirius was moving. Um, people didn't know why, but knowing physics, they knew there must be an invisible companion around it that made Sirius move. And it wasn't until uh, the Hubble Space Telescope in recent times that the, the companion was discovered. It is very much smaller than Sirius itself, but it's very bright and very compact and very clo close. And um, it is called the white dwarf. It is the end product of stellar evolution, of stellar lives. The sun will become a white dwarf in about five billion years. I've become fascinated not just with old stars, but also with stars that live in pairs or in couples all their lives. So I call myself an old couples therapist. If you are doing therapy with uh, people who've lived uh, together all their lives, who've been married for 50 years, probably they've been changed by that relationship. Um, and so I have been interested in stars that lived in pairs all their lives and have been changed by the relationship. And here I have an artist's rendition. Remember, this is not a photograph of real stars, it's just a painting of um, uh, an artist that, that, that rendered what astronomers have been able to surmise from real observations. We have a star giving mass to a little white dwarf star, creating a big swirl of matter in between uh, the two. And that matter shines, and unless you can see directly, which mostly you can't because the stars are so far away, you have to surmise what is going on from the light and the light changes that you see. Um, so to give you a little bit of a backstory of why stars interact in that way, well, when stars are born, they're relatively small, and they go through a long time where they're rotating around each other, but they're, they're not really um, interacting. So it's like uh, two people who are married, but they live in different countries. So they know of each other, and they have a relationship, but they don't really interact. Now, when stars get old, they become big. And here I have on the left, the little yellow dot is the sun today. The big uh, or round orange thing is the sun in about five billion years when it will grow at the end of its life. And on the right, you can probably not even see it pointed by the arrow, is the sun as it will be when it becomes a white dwarf, a tiny, 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 tiny object the size of Earth. So this growth, of course, uh, poses some interesting issues for the companion. Here I have a star orbited by a companion. And uh, the star in the middle, the blue star, will grow when it gets old, as I said. 
As it grows, it will completely engulf the companion in its orbit, and an interaction will be naturally what happens. Now, here, I was told I couldn't show you movies today because of the time lag. Uh, I have a, just a snapshot from a movie that is carried out not in, uh, in uh, CGI, uh, like in the movies that you see at, at the cinema, but it is an actual computation. So we take a star and we describe it with its density and its temperature and its size, and we put a companion in orbit around a star and we let them go. And we look how gas flows from one star to the other in this kind of dance, in this swirl. And we try to deduce what happens as a result of this. What would it look like if we could observe it from afar? Um, likely, you would see an outburst of light. Uh, you would see ejecta coming out, uh, gas is spewed away from the system as the dance continues. Um, here, I have an artist's rendition again. So this is again an artist's painting of something very similar to what I showed before. And I'm using it to tell you um, something very important. There's a difference between what an artist can paint, uh, even a realistic painting, to what a scientist calculates in the computer, where it really is as if it happened in real life, with the laws of physics applying. Um, but here, in a sense, the artist's rendition can really help the imagination to, to think about what the data is telling you, whereas the... Uh, uh, the, 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 the computation might not give you as immediate an idea. This is a real image of the spewing of the gas that can result from an artist, uh, from, sorry, from a dance of stars that I showed before. And here is the complexity and, so, uh, and, and just how many different shapes you can get. Now, my work is trying to explain the shapes and to explain the outburst that you get from stars as a result of the dances between the two stars that I described. I have one last thing to tell you, and it's not about my science and it's not about my story, but it is about being a woman in science. There are fewer women in physics, even fewer in engineering and computing. Um, there are even fewer women at my age level, because uh, some, for some reason we lose the young women to other paths. Um, this is not because women are discriminated. There are some cases of discrimination. Uh, you hear them in the news, but there's not so many today. There certainly were 100 years ago. Today is much better. So why are there so many fewer women uh, in, in, in science? Um, we call this the gender gap. We have a picture here of a conference in 1927. Uh, there are a lot of physicists in that picture, but there's only one woman, Marie Curie, who won two Nobel Prizes, <laughs> my God. Um, and, um, uh, and it is very important that the gender gap be bridge today because uh, we need an equitable and diverse society to squeeze the best science out of the entire population. We need the women because there's many women out there who are just as good as the men, but they're not coming forth. They're not choosing those paths. They're not getting into the subject and we're missing out. If women had been uh, as numerous as men back from 1927, can you imagine how many more discoveries will be on the plate today? How many more lives will be saved because all those medical uh, advancements would have been had already? So we need everybody, we need the top people to be in the field today. We're missing half of the population. Some of the reason for this is even today there is a strong implicit bias. Implicit bias is the bias we have, but we don't know what we have. It is documented that uh, women are discriminated implicitly against by men, but also, and in fact sometimes even more so, by women. When you get women and men applying for the same job, and it's being studied with giving the same CV to, to panels, with where only the name is changed, John Smith and Joan Smith, it's shown that the women get the job less, they get paid less. Uh, this bias can be fought by making it explicit, by knowing we have it, by working with it. Imposter syndrome is something that also limits the number of women in science. Women um, tend to have a feeling that they are not quite good enough, more than men. Some men have it too, but women are really excellent at it. I myself all the time give a talk in front of people and thinking, oh my God, somebody will call me out. Oh my God, I'm saying this, but I'm not really knowing what I'm telling them. And it's very important to know that we all suffer from it and we have to fight it. Often when you give a talk, you are the expert and perhaps no one in the room is as good as you. And finally, the stereotype threat. 
Uh, I have a little cartoon at the bottom, somebody not doing a math thing that is not quite right, and somebody says, oh my God, you're not very good at math. But if you're a woman, people will say, oh, women are not very good at math. We often act the stereotypes. It's shown that if women do tests in maths and they write their gender before taking the test, they systematically do worse in the test than if the gender is polled at the end of the test. We have to know that stereotypes don't necessarily apply and we have to fight that actively. So I finally, I'll leave you my final message. Love what you do, find out what you love. You will spend an awful lot of time doing your job in your life. You better do something you like. Do not worry about money, that will come out in the wash, I guarantee it. I said do not worry about family, of course, worry about family, but do not worry about people telling you what to do. You must do what you feel you want to do. And do not worry about perceptions of others. You really, it has to come from within yourself. And uh, with that, I leave you. And I believe there's some questions that can be uh, asked and I will be here to answer them. Thank you. Of course, but you know what? I was surrounded with good women, uh, both young and old, and good men too. You know, find your mentors, find those people who are there to encourage you. When you find them, they'll help you get through difficult times when you feel, oh my God, I, I'm not going to be able to do this. So there's people around. You're not alone. So remember, I said, choose alone. Or choose, choose what you want, but ask, 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 and find the good people. And to answer the, what's my favorite thing about astronomy? Well, I mean, I guess it is really a quest of the unknown. More so. I mean, I, this idea of the remote. And um, I also love observing. I love going to these mountains and being up in the night. And, and it is a beautiful sensation. And this data that comes from so far away, you know, most of the stars I studied might well have died today because the light takes time to come here. So we're still seeing them. They might have died, but it'll be a while before we get that message. The star might have exploded and I'm still there studying it. Um, and maybe in, uh, in, you know, in a thousand years, uh, my, my descendants will know that the star is blown up. So it's this remoteness and in this uh, quest for the unknown. Yes. Bye.